Okay, Kant's philosophy. <clears throat> so, this, I'm going to call it the Red Book. My Red Book, start with, we have the international style, beginning in the 1920s and 30s, and invading America after World War II. And it's, I'll use a word, it's very thin. Walls of, look at this wall. About a foot and a half, and it's even thicker in Higgins Hall South, um, as opposed to a quarter inch of glass. Now, but it's thin culturally. They're not sure what they mean by that, but there's a dissatisfaction with <clears throat> we have rejected monumentality. Think of the buildings in Washington D.C. or New York, Metropolitan Museum. Grand Central Station, 42nd Street Library, Brooklyn Museum. These are monumental buildings. Now we're going to get to a definition of monumentality. But there's a rejection of that. That's a celebration of the past. That is a <clears throat> cementing of the power of the elite. And modern architecture seeks to be democratic. Then we find ourselves in World War II why are we fighting? You know, there are political reasons. Pearl Harbor was bombed, whatever. <clears throat> but we're fighting for democratic freedom. What the hell does that mean? If it's so important that we would die for it, shouldn't we embed it into our architecture? Shouldn't we have some kind of monumentality? What are our values? And they're certainly not expressed by functionalism. So there starts to be a groping around, looking for a new monumentality. They don't get anywhere. I'll bring this up again shortly, but Louis Kahn writes in 1947, how about the new monumentality, the monumentality of the hospital, the community center, the daycare center, he very quickly realizes, boy, is that lame. <laughs> Monumentality of the daycare center. Um, so what are we looking for? Ah, maybe we're looking for order instead of monumental. Well, what is order? The building being rooted in itself, like you said. Now, what does that mean? I'll simplify it. A school is a place for learning. What if we root a school not in the scholastic Gothic architecture of the past, the way the Yale campus does, but we root it in learning. Now that's not going to be easy, but it's giving us a start. We root the during a laboratory, rooted in science. What oh my God, science! That's an incredible thing. Can we understand that and express it in our architecture? That means that's a definition of rooting the building in itself. Desire. Forget what I said about desire. I have to look it up. But what Kant says, we have needs and desires. Animals have needs. You have to eat. You have to breathe. But human beings have desire. And there are three great desires, big ones. Desire for well-being, desire to come together, I don't remember, desire to learn. And these desires are the roots of our institutions. The school should reflect our desire to learn. The laboratory should reflect our desire to know. That leads to architecture as the art of institutions. This is, I think, the most important statement here. In the 1950s, <clears throat> what architecture is an art. What's it the art of? Well, painting's the art of the two-dimensional surface. Music is the art of time. Okay. Architecture's the art of space. What does that tell us? Not very much. Yes, yeah, space is important. And Frank Lloyd Wright revolutionizes space beginning of the 20th century. But think about it. 
all architectures for institutions. The school is for the institution of education, the laboratory is the institution of science, the church is for the institution of religion, the house is for the institution of residence. What does residence mean? How do we live today in the 21st century compared to the 20th century, compared to the 18th century? What is a family? What do we do in a home? The architecture of the house should reflect an understanding of what the family is or we want it to be. You do a school in studio. I'm on your jury. You're going to look, okay, we need enough classrooms. We need egress. We need got to stand up. But what's your philosophy of education? Is education for the acculturation of a person into their society? Or is education for allowing each individual to find their true nature and manifest that or something else? I should see what your position is about what is education in your architecture. That's what it should be doing. I remember one of our professors was doing really cool stuff in their studio. And one of these, they're doing a school. And one of their, there's this really cool renderings. And I said to the student, is there a reason why your school looks like the evil twin of the Millennium Falcon? <laughs> I mean, it was a really cool building, but what did it have to do with their, what they wanted to project and put forward about education? Form and design. Let's see if I've got it. I'm going to get my laser point. Okay. Now, we're going to see this again. What Kant says is the same thing said by Franklin Wright and Louis Sullivan. The problem is they all use different words. So form is not shape. Form is the underlying organizational principle of the building. What do we have here? I'll give you an example. He's doing a church, Rochester Church. He says, first you have the sanctuary, and the sanctuary are for those who kneel. Around the sanctuary is an ambulatory. The ambulatory is for those who want to feel near. And around, and then there's a garden and a wall. And the wall is for those who would just wait. So there's a church diagonally across the street from Higgins. I've never been in there, but I know it's there. So that's, I'm using it in that way, as opposed to the congregation that uses it by being there every single day. It's another way to use it. Once the architect understands that, they know how to design it. First, there's a sad church. This neighborhood goes along to the near the garden, and then a wall, and the wall is for those who want to near. Ah, now we got a form diagram. Now we got to get this into so that changes the building. So design responds to the circumstantial. And responding to the circumstantial, you try to keep the form. If you can't, we got to go back to form is what the design is how. Materials. What does Kahn say to? What does the brick say to Kahn? You're thinking of the nature of materials. You say to brick, I have an opening and I can put a lintel over it. Concrete lintels are cheap. What do you think of that brick? And brick says, I like an arch. Now, this is ubiquitous in modern architecture. Steel wants to be thin, attenuated, and in tension. Concrete wants to be squat, massive, and heavy. Corbeau, Mies, everybody that's inherent in modern architecture. It's not unique to concrete. Building as vocabulary. And that came up in our discussions here. What Khan, the words Khan wants to use, words and quotes, 
in order to project his idea is the building. How it's put together isn't just, oh, economical or expresses the structure. It tells the story of what he wants to say about what a school is or a laboratory. Existence will. The brick wants to be an arch. And we'll get to that in a minute. That's a big problem. But the concrete wants to be squat and in compression. Steel wants, has an existent will. Existence will. It wants to be attenuated in intention. Uh, another modern architecture. This is Kahn, Sullivan, Wright, and even Mies. Not just functionalism and essentialism. This is a dangerous concept, very much out of favor. <laughs> if I say steel wants to be attenuated and intention. Existence will, essentialism implies there's an essential nature to brick, steel. <laughs> it's rejected in contemporary thought, particularly contemporary feminism. Because if we say women are essentially X, Y, and Z, men are essentially A, B, and C, that then implies we can put men and women in certain roles and forbid women and men to the roles they don't belong in. And any characteristic you can say, men are assertive. On average, men may be, more men may be assertive than women but there are plenty of women that are more assertive than men. So there are no essential characteristics of men or women. And so that's one rejection of essentialism. The other one is it's mystical. What do you mean the essence of a brick? Can you squeeze the essence out? Where, what part of the brick is the essence? But my argument is if it doesn't make sense in science or social science, it does make sense in the arts. And without any of us taking a pro or con stand, Kahn, Wright, and Sullivan certainly believed in, or spoke as though they believed in essentialism. Okay, now major themes in Kahn's architecture. So that's played out in the introduction to this book, but let's just jump ahead. Rejection of the flexible plan. So Mises' five points to a new architecture. This is the old, this is the new. The old is bearing walls. Once you have steel and concrete, you can have thin columns. So number one, columns. Number two, the free plan. When you have bearing walls, they define the rooms. You can't, you can't avoid them. When you have columns, you can put the walls anywhere. That's the key point that Kahn rejects. He says, once you have a structure and it clicks for him, in a Trenton bathhouse. This is simply a place to change into your bathing suit at the community swimming pool. It's a rinky-dink little building, but all of Khan is right here. Stop here, this is the whole thing. No one would have noticed, but it's all here. The structure, which is these now servant spaces, to that in a minute. Define the architectural layout. And we see that then fully expressed in the medical towers. Column, 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 column. A rejection of the flexible plan. We've got the structure and mechanical determining an approach to the plan. Served and servant spaces. This is a big thing with Kahn, and then he abandoned it, but it's residually remains. Serve, servant spaces are 
stairs, air ducts, elevators, served spaces are the functional spaces of the building. So in a house, the served spaces would be the bedroom, living room, dining room. Servant spaces would be bathroom, closet, storage, kitchen. And now oh, let's just everybody imagine, I didn't put in as many examples here as I should have, but imagine Philip Johnson's glass house. It's one glass box. It doesn't differentiate how it does have a tube for the bathroom. But it's as though you can do everything in one kind of space. And Khan is saying how oh, there are two kinds of spaces. Eventually, he realizes an infinite number of spaces. Plan as a giver of meaning. What these spaces are and how they're used is determined by the plan. Now, at this point, I should be showing you a section of Paul Rudolph's Art and Architecture book has 11 levels. And so a section is important. For Khan, is mostly thought of in plan. And relational hierarchy. We've got this space, then we got these three guys, then we got these guys. It's like a fractal. Bing, bing, bing. Everybody knows what a fractal is? Fractal is a self-similar geometry. And in fact, Khan is in touch with Adel van Eyck at this time, who does this in his Amsterdam orphanage. So that's relational hierarchy. Bing, 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 bing. Big, medium, small, tiny. Centers of buildings. So modern architecture had done away with centers of the building. Come in and there's a big dome. Khan brings that back in Exeter, Bangladesh, and Bryn Mawr Dorms. Now here's Corbu <coughs> with his column grid. The uh, assembly building at Chandigarh, India. And now he needs a big center. He just drops it into the grid. It doesn't organize the building. Next is the entrance. So here is Frank Furness's Furness Library at Penn. And you can't really see it here, but okay, here's the main space. Here's the stair tower. Could have influenced Khan, the medical towers. And then here's a portico for the entrance. You can just see it here. Too many trees here, I can't get a good shot of it. But it's right here. That's not so, you can see that. Good. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright does away with that, as does Kahn. So, for the medical towers, he takes one of the pavilions and knocks it out. And that's the entrance. Same thing with Yale British Museum. Here's his grid. He takes four squares of the grid and knocks them out. And that's the entrance. Now it's a pretty dank entrance. You come in and it's low. Leaves have gathered in there. But then when you come in, you go through these doors, it explodes all the way up to the skylights. 
Franklin Wright does something similar in the Guggenheim. Here we again use one of the modules, the two of the modules, the porch and the empty lobby for the Kimbo Museum. The wholeness of buildings and modular buildings, Khan does both. <coughs> so here's Exeter Library. There's no way to expand this building. You can't put a wing on over here. Now, the library's getting bigger or shrinking. Once you have computers, maybe you don't need as many books and magazines. But I'm, I, I pay, it's embarrassing how much, for many stores about the size of this room full of books. And I can't even give them to the live the Strand bookstores. I used to just take boxes there and they'd give me money. Once I took, it was one box, but it was all my rare books. They gave me $3,000. But um, they won't take them anymore. They're, people aren't buying enough books. So I said, I'll give them to the Pratt, like books like this, I want to give to the Pratt Library. We can't take them. We don't have any room. I would think they would have room, but they, they don't. So you can't expand this building. And maybe you should be able to because it's a library. Now, here is Kimball Art Museum. And Romano Jergola proposed, the client asked him, to put another wing on that was exactly like what was there and the architectural community objected. But this is modular, it could be added onto. This is the medical towers, it could, and it was added onto. Now this was done at the same time by Khan. But you can see the modularity, it does, it is able to grow. You could imagine adding more this way. Nobody's going to because it's a precious building. So, structure as generative. I don't have it here, but if you were to take everything away except the structure, this would look the same. The windows would be gone, but the structure defines the architecture. This is the Trenton Community Center that did not get built. Here's the structural grid. And here it is. The spaces determined by the grid. So we get medium square spaces, rectilinear spaces, very small square spaces and big spaces like the gymnasium in which we leave out the columns and then the ones that are there get beefed up. So structure is generative of the plan. It's not just hidden white. Mechanical is the equal of structure. So Khan realized in a laboratory, the mechanical is half the square footage, half the cubic footage, and half the budget. Should we then hide it? And in the office, typical office building, you do. Elevators, stairs, toilets, ducts are all in the core. This is the Seagram building growing up at the same time as Kahn's building. Kahn pulls all this out to the periphery and expresses the mechanical rather than hiding it. Okay, here's a key concept in architecture, two concepts. Articulation and integration. Integration. Make two things the same thing. 
So this is Frank Lloyd Wright, Research Tower, Johnson Wax. Original building, 1936, the tower, 1952. It's like a tree trunk. The center is the structure. No columns on the edges. The center is the structure. And it's like you take a drawing tube and you thread paper plates on it. Now, this center drawing tube is the structure. Everything is cantilevered out from it. But it's also the mechanical. It's also elevator, stairs, ducts. Just like the trunk of the tree is the structure of the tree, but it's also the sap running up and down. All the nutrients, the water goes up, the sugars go down from the photosynthesis. It's not, okay, here's the structure and here's the mechanical. It's the same thing. They're integrated. Khan differentiates them. Here's this, we can just see. Here's the structure. Remember those precast columns. And then here's the fire stick. He didn't need the structure. The fire stair is a poured in place concrete with brick veneer. That fire stair could have held up the building. Concrete tube, concrete tube, concrete tube, concrete tube. Holding up the slab, you don't need the structure. You'd have to beef up the stairs a bit. But boy, could you have saved a lot of money. But even though this is structure, this is mechanical, the air ducts of the fire stair. So that's articulation. So one isn't better than the other. We just observe when they do it. <clears throat> Let me give you another example. You can't see me, but I'll get it in a minute. Okay, I'm looking for Frank Lloyd Wright's Johnson Wax, a particular shot. Get my laser pointer back. The essence of materials. So we'll talk more about that in the second half of our discussion today, but Bricks like an arch. Brick can be spared the work by a concrete lintel, but no, I could do it myself. Preference for masonry. The thing on the left is by Kahn, done in 1947. It's a community center of the future. Khan said in the 70s, I believe the architecture of the future will look like giant insects. It will be made of welded steel and plastic. So here is this steel structure. It's sort of a modern implementation of a Gothic cathedral. And then these bubbles 
are the um, plastic skylights. It says, but I personally prefer to work in masonry. So he doesn't say you should do masonry or masonry is better, not at all. That's his personal preference. He says, form and design, forms and underlying concept. Design is how it's carried out. Form belongs to everybody. Is this the right concept? Design is personal to the designer. You can't criticize him. You can't say, Mies is wrong for using steel. You should use concrete. No, well, who uses concrete? Mies uses steel. The building is the record of the making of the building. So I told you the whole story of how medical towers are precast pre-stressed, post-tension, assembled by giant crane. Every time you walk into the building, you see that story. Here's, the columns are made up of pieces that are one story. And we have similar construction in Higgins Hall Center. And you just look up and there it all is. Now, there's a reason for this, that, okay, I'm a scientist. I'm walking into the lab. Why would I want to know how the building's put together? What does that have to do with anything? Architects might get off on that. What does that have to do with me? Khan says, <clears throat> the building is the record of the making of the building. The man is the record of the making of the man how we came together, not just evolutionarily, but metaphysically, and that's a whole discussion. We feel an in-touchness with how we are made in seeing how the building's made, or experiencing how the building's made. Details. So I showed you the door frame and the concrete block as tile. If you look at the curving stair going down to the theater in Higgins Hall Center, you can tell somebody gave that to a junior person in the office to detail that. So sloppy in the door, the entrance to Higgins Hall Center. There's just no thought in that. Light. So after the problems with medical towers, Khan was traveling in Africa, and he saw women doing laundry facing a wall. The sun would hit the wall and bounce off and illuminate their work. And he gets this idea that the double wall, light comes in, bounces off this wall, and goes into the inner space. So this is the Salk meeting house. Rome. Khan had a Beaux-Arts education. And that certainly influenced him. When he finished school, he entered the world of international style modern architecture and worked in that vocabulary, doing some very mediocre buildings. He did not revert to the Beaux-Arts. He traveled in Europe, saw Rome, saw Greece and Italy, and reached back to the great forms of Rome. Maybe touching base at Boulay and Ledoux. 
the Lay's great central tap for Newton, the big sphere, and then Piranesi's map of Rome that he had on his building, on his wall. <clears throat> and we see these Roman-like forms in Dhaka. And finally, light and Rome. So, in the Pantheon, the light comes through the oculus, paints the wall, is reflected to illuminate the space. You can see Khan doing something like that in Exeter. Now, anybody been to Pompeii? So when you go to Pompeii, Pompeii is a Roman city that got buried by volcanic ash from Mount Vesuvius. And when they dug it up, it was intact. You see people eating lunch. You can see what the, the lunch plate looked like, the knives and forks. Everything was there, including the mummified bodies. On the other side of the mountain was Herculaneum, another city like Pompeii. They've only dug up about a quarter of Herculaneum, because A, there's a town on top of it, and B, they realize when you dig this stuff up, it starts to deteriorate very fast. So it's being left alone. But they did dig up the Roman bath in Herculaneum. So as a student, I'm climbing through the bath, Oh my God, it's Khan. Uh, you could just see Khan in those Roman spaces. So, any questions about Khan's approach? Okay, we have not even gotten to his. Okay, on to Khan's spiritual philosophy. So, we might say Khan made two contributions, one to architecture and another to spiritual philosophy, and that the two are related, but can also be seen independently. So let's see, Khan uses all these cool phrases. What does this building want to be? Silence and light. And it all sounds cool, but it's my contention it actually means something. So let's try to unpack some of this. What does this building want to be? There are immediately two things wrong with this statement. Anybody see something wrong with this? Let's be real obvious. Nothing. It's a building. How can it want anything? <laughs> but there's another big one. It doesn't exist yet. So a project would come into the office and Khan would, with, with his staff in the office, or he'd bring it to studio and, well, they want a school. What does this building want to be? It doesn't exist yet. So how can a building want anything? Now, Louis Sullivan says something similar. Remember we said modern architects pretty much accept steel wants to be attenuated and in tension. Concrete wants to be squat and in compression. What does that mean? How can it want anything? 
And Sullivan says, that's right. It's an inanimate thing. It can't want anything. But it can in dialogue with the architect. So this is a compacted in this phrase. It's like a whole book. In this Sullivan's approach, the architect is like a midwife. The building is wanting to be born. The architect is helping that happen. So the building, according to Sullivan, grows out of this interaction. It's not just an imposition of the architect's ego and will. So the problem of the building doesn't exist yet. Well, that implies something. It does exist. But there are two realms. There's a realm of potential. So there's a hill. There's a beautiful building on that hill. Where was that building before it got built? Well, the fact that it's built means it had the potential to be built. So it was in the realm of potential. So we got two realms, the realm of potential and the realm of realization. And the building resides in the realm of potential before the architect brings it into realization. That's silence and light. Silence is the realm of potential. Light is the realm of realization. This implies essentialism. <laughs> that there's, there's something a school wants to be. And it implies an existence will. So, you now get, I'm going to give you the phrase, the will to power. With whom do we associate that? Anybody? Friedrich Nietzsche. And the world, the world as will and representation. Anybody heard that before? That's the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, the name of his book. German idealist philosophy sees this realm of the will. What, what I'm about is to project my John Lobelness. Everything wants to manifest itself. The acorn wants to be an oak tree. Everything seeks to project its identity. Now, Schopenhauer is saying, ultimate reality is this will and what we see is it, the manifestation, representation. This also implies architecture is the art of institutions. What does this building want to be? What that means is, what is, if we're doing a school, what is education all about? We're doing a laboratory. What is scientific research all about? What is science? Architecture is a projection of what is science timelessly and in our time. So this is how we can see a rich unfolding from a simple phrase. Now, there's a lot of places to begin. So I'm going to choose monumentality. But it's, you could begin elsewhere. So, I'm struck by how unclear most of my colleagues are. For example, in second year history, I used to teach second year history, they don't let me anymore. 
my colleagues refer to Klein's architecture as monumental. It is exactly not monumental, because they don't know what monumental is. Monumentality is the celebration in the form of a past that we value and feel is still living in us today. So we look at the National Gallery in Washington, John Russell Pope, 1941, finish. It's a pantheon with two wings. Okay, what's that building saying? It's saying our society is built on Rome. We find our roots in Rome. Roman values are alive in our culture today. And Rome got it from Greece, so, and it got modified through the Renaissance and Baroque. So we are Greek, Roman, and European in our origins and in our culture. So it's a monument celebrating these Greek and Roman roots. This is exactly what modern architecture is rejecting. It's not just rejecting the columns, the dome. It's, that's superficial. It's rejecting that we are descendants of Rome. No. There's a whole new modern world. So modernism rejects monumentality. The program of modernism is to make a new human being in society, to reject the past and European culture. They're negative and should be done away with. Instead, we should have a universal materialist culture rooted in science and rationality, not rooted in the past. So, there's a simple definition of modernism. The scientific revolution replaces tradition and authority with rationality and experiment. The Enlightenment is the application of that rejection of tradition and application of rationality and experiment to human affairs. So what should a marriage be? What should a family be? Well, there's a tradition, there's the Bible, there's what it was to your parents and grandparents, it's what it is in your culture. Or let's think about it. Does it have to be a man and a woman? Does it have to have a child, the children? Can it be about different things for different people? Let's think this through as opposed to accept tradition. That's modernism. Does a museum have to have a dome? Well, what goes on in a museum? What are we trying to do here? We're showing paintings, but what we need light, we need space. We need circulation. Does the dome give us that? Let's not just grab our tradition. Let's analyze the problem. That's modernism. And modernism goes further. Modernism, not just architecture, but modernism. We're going to make a new human being. We're going to make a new society. We're going to do away with oppression, we're going to erase democracy, etc. And what we come up with will be universal, it will be applicable everywhere. So I'm showing Walter Gropius as the Bauhaus here. Dorms classrooms, shops, administration, tying it all together. 
functionally laid out. Now, Kahn had rejected monumentality along with everybody else in becoming a modern architect. But along with everybody else, in, with World War II, they started saying, well, wait a minute, what are our values? And shouldn't they be expressed in our architecture? And Kahn talks about the new monumentality and I said it before. The monumentality of the hospital and the community center. I added the daycare center just to be snide. But, you know, it's like, wait a minute, that's not working. Well, if we don't bring back monumentality, <coughs> excuse me, if we don't bring back monumentality, and we're not happy with steel and glass, what should our functionalism is not giving us a rich enough architecture? What should our architecture be rooted in? And Kahn says order. Now, order is not we should put all the chairs in a row. That would be orderly, but it's not what Kahn means. What would be the order of the school? And you brought that up. In other words, rooted in itself. What is education? Well, Kahn thinks you might find it in beginnings. Where does school begin? And he does not mean historically. He means metaphorically, poetically. He says, school began with a group of people under a tree. And one of them was talking. And the others realized that he was a teacher. And they wanted that experience to be repeated for their children. So the next day they go back to the tree. Is it going to happen again? What's the chances that everybody, that the guy will show up? What's the, you know, it's the, well, there's a way to make that happen. Let's create a schedule. Let's create a school. The deal is we'll find a space. We'll agree who's doing the lecturing, the teaching. We'll all agree to be here at 930. Hey, you guys, let's show up at 9.30. It's not fair to the people who are here. Let me wait 10 minutes. You all agree to show up at 9.30 <coughs> on Wednesdays. And we got a school. Now, what should that school be all about? That's what you'll express when you design your school. The realization of its all aboutness through the form you create. So that's what Khan means by order. The underlying origin of something. So it was not monumentality rooted in the European past. The modern architecture was lacking, but order, rootedness in its own nature. In other words, when Gropius does the Bauhaus, if we want to, nothing wrong with this building, but if we want to say it's not enough, there's no, there's no substance, it's a box. It's three boxes strung together. What is it? Well, what's lacking? Well, should we put a dome and some columns on it? No. We should put a rootedness in an understanding of what school is. Now, that's not easy. What's a church? First, you have a sanctuary, and the sanctuary is for those who want to kneel, to pray, 
Then you have an ambulatory. The ambulatory is those who want to be near. That's not an understanding of a church. Now we know how to do the architecture. The architecture should reveal, manifest. First you have a, et cetera. So that's what Khan means by order. Now, in fact, Khan says, you, he couldn't say what order is. Now what we're looking at is this book. And I send you all the Khan's text. Now there's also my introduction and my explanation. So it's, I couldn't could get the whole book. But. Khan did not write. Just wrote a few notes. He lectured. And he traveled a lot and lectured lots of places. People recorded and transcribed the lectures and put them in the back of magazines. If you did an issue on Khan, you'd have a lecture. He gave his last and best lecture at Pratt. Somebody happened to record it. I had to take it. After Khan died, I came up with the idea of doing this book. I transcribed the tape. It was really tedious because we didn't have computers. So a lot of typing and cutting and scotch taping. Because the way he spoke, it was not in any order. So I had to get the whole thing pinned up on the wall, figure out what he was saying, put it in the right order, and then go to other lectures by Khan in the backs of other magazines to find the best version or fill in missing parts. And so this is the ideal Khan lecture. In it, he talks about order. I'll talk about the order of the lecture, using the word order differently here. The sequences of the lecture later. But I tried to find what order is. And finally, I stopped just saying order is. So what is God? You can't say God transcends concept. You can only speak in concepts. Order transcends concept. Now I'm going to tell you what order is, but you're not supposed to. Order is the same as Tao, T-A-O, in the Tao Te Ching, Chinese philosophy. The, the, the Tao Te Ching opens, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. In other words, you can't say what the Tao is. But the Tao is the way, the way of all things, how everything works. Now, how does everything work? Well, what do you, how do you describe something that you can't describe? Through a poetic metaphor. You can't define it, but you can sort of make metaphors around it. The metaphor Khan uses is silence and light. Very simply, silence is a realm of potential, light is a realm of manifestation. Art is the means of bringing something from silence to light. Silence, the unmeasurable desire to be. So, the building, for example, is residing in the realm of silence. It's, it has no shape, but it has a desire to come into manifestation. The acorn is desiring to be an oak tree. Now we say it's DNA, but metaphorically, the, oak, the acorn does not look like an oak tree, but it is 
a bundle of desire to be an oak tree. But it has no form, nothing measurable. Desire to be, desire to express, source of new need. Light is the measurable giver of all presence by will, by law, the measure of things already made. Now it's in realization. Now it's not material yet, that's one more step. But from potential to realization is silence to light. That process is order. Order is, the Tao is the way of all things. Khan's order is the process, the nature of all things and the process whereby things come into being. Now, light is cool because it has a dual nature. It's the, metaphorically the realm of realization, but it's also the sun. I said that all material nature, the mountains and the streams and the air and we, are made of light that has been spent. The wall is where the light stops and the material begins. In an architectural drawing, the black line is where the light is not and where, because it's black, and where the wall is going to be. So he's playing with all these ideas poetically intertwined. Now, we've gone from Silence, the realm of potential, light, the realm of realization. Now we're going to come into material manifestation. For example, if you think of brick and you're consulting the orders, you can have the order of school, the order of brick. You consider the nature of brick. You say to brick, what do you want, brick? Brick says to you, I like an arch. If you say to Brick, arches are expensive, and I can use a concrete lintel over an opening, what do you think of that Brick? Brick says, I like an arch. So he says, Brick's built Rome. We should respect Brick. Now, there's a dozen ideas like this. This is just one of them in this book, and you have the PDF. But let's just take this one idea. Louis Sullivan, in his last book, has this in the fourth piece of the book. The germ is the real thing, the seed of identity. By germ, he means take a seed, take a peanut, and open it. These are the cotyledons. They're going to provide the food to get the shoot going until photosynthesis kicks in. But that here is the germ. This is the real thing. This is the thing that's going to grow. The germ is the real thing. The seat of right here. The seat of identity. Within its delicate mechanism lies the will to power. That's the will that is wanting to be the oak tree or the peanut plant. Now, the function which is to seek and eventually to find its full expression in form. So, form follows function. The function is not how many people are going down the hall during a fire drill. The function is the will to be an oak tree. The form is the oak tree, the ultimate expression. So Sullivan is saying the same thing that Kahn is saying. Franklin Wright says, what is honor? Not the rules of a code, but the nature of honor. What would be the honor of the brick? of the brick. Now what does that mean, the honor of the brick? 
that in the brick which makes the brick a brick. There's an essential identity in the brick which is gathering to itself redness, hardness, squareness. Those are all later added on characteristics that the essence of the brick pulls to itself. The fine Martin Heidegger's thinking is similar. Now, total digression. This is the entrance to Johnson Wax. Looking up, this looks like it's a parapet with a walkway up there. But here we see this much is parapet. This much is facer for the AC ducts, and here's a vent, a grill. So this is parapet from here to here. This is AC from here to here. There's no difference. They write, integrates them rather than articulating them. Khan would never do that. Usually would never do that. There is an example where he does. So, Wright is saying the same thing. So if you get a chance sometime, you can read this book. Now, As I put the book in order, I was writing the book, and this is not the order of Khan lecture, I came up with this order sequence. And I was inspired by the Tao Te Ching by translation by Fuang in English, highly recommended. And it begins with joy. I felt, first of all, joyous. And I felt that joy must have been in every ingredient of our making. Now, okay, what does that mean? Why does he begin with that? He didn't begin with that, but I figured out that's the beginning. He says, I felt, first of all. There are two traditions. Spirit comes from without, spirit comes from within. In the biblical tradition, God makes the first human in clay, and it's dead. The earth is inanimate. God breathes the spirit of life into the dead clay, animating it. Spirit comes from without. In Asian traditions, for example, as you see in the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, spirit is already within all things. Spirit does not come from without, it comes, it is already in all things. These are two hugely different notions with implications, for example, for ecology. What's our relationship to nature? Khan is taking a position that spirit comes from within. Spirit is already in all things. Joy must have been in every ingredient of our making. It was not injected from without. So, if you have somebody you respect, an architect like Khan or like Venturi or Denise Scott Brown, you can assume there's a lot there. Sometimes they might be stumbling around. Sometimes they might not make sense. But what makes them important is that they probably do make sense. And if you delve into them closely, you can find out what it is that they're saying and what it might, 
how you might apply it in other areas. So, two quotes toward the end of my book. The great building must begin with the unmeasurable. So, what is education? Well, what is a human being? Must go through measurable means when it's being designed. Bricks, budgets, payoffs, corrupt politicians, contractors. And in the end, must be unmeasurable. When the building is finished, somebody coming to it will encounter your realization of what is education, what is a human being, whatever it is you're putting into the building. But it still has to be made out of material. A work is made in the urging sound of industry. And when the dust settles, the pyramid, echoing silence, gives the sun its shadow. 